one of the things that I learned is that our soul can be in more than one place at a time. He was actually at the house with my mom while I was in surgery at the hospital. Because we are so intertwined with our kids and the people that are close to our life, he could feel that I was getting ready to leave. Hello, Michelle, and welcome. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited about this conversation because I was going cross country uh, during Easter. I love that. And then I was listening to NDEs and I came across your interview with Alex Ferrari. And I just noticed what it did to me. Like I immediately changed my frequency when you told, told us, you know, about your divine experiences. I, I feel like I'm getting this hope, this, um, my, my energy is just expanding. So there's a deeper reason why I'm doing this. And I think there's a deeper reason why many people are drawn to these stories, listening to, uh, people who've had experiences like yours and also who are drawn to spirituality, because it sort of gives us this, this notion that there's so much more than sometimes this mundane life seem to be when things are hard. So I think these messages are so important. So I've decided I'm going to focus more on NDEs. And I also know that you're a medium today. Uh, you're communicating with angels and people who have passed over to the other side. You're an energetic healer. You have so many abilities. So, I mean, this conversation can go so many places. I'm excited about that. But before we go into your NDs, because it's very interesting because you had not only one or two, but three near-death experiences. Uh, and that's interesting in itself. But I'm curious, before all that, were you spiritual at all? Like, what was your upbringing like? So we just know where you sort of started. Right. I was raised Catholic, so I did have a religious background. When I was 13, my grandfather passed away, 12 to 13, right in there. And what I realized was he and I were still communicating. So I would tell my mom, grandpa said this, and my mom would say, that's what you think he would say if he was still here. And so I realized pretty quickly that they weren't still talking with grandpa the way that I was. So I just started to keep that for myself. I didn't share it because nobody else really seemed ready to hear it. But I did have this beautiful upbringing with the Catholic religion. And what I would say about that that was really beneficial for me was I believed in angels, saints, Mother Mary, Jesus. So in my mind, I already had this team of spiritual beings who were there to help me. You know, if I lost my dog, I would pray to St. Francis. If I was going on a trip, you know, I prayed to St. Christopher. So I already felt like there was a team around me, even though I didn't necessarily have those words for it. Uh, so how did you communicate with your grandfather? Like, how did you receive that message? Was it, you know, through something you saw, something you heard? I'm curious, because that seems to be different for different mediums. It is. And the way that I receive my messages is through feelings. And so basically, I am feeling what they're wanting to tell me. A lot of times, um, I'll describe that as looking at someone that you know well, and you know exactly what they're going to say before they Sorry. say. <laughs> I just was sneezing right there. <laughs> Sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. And so a lot of times the way that it is, is it's exactly what someone would say right before they say it. And you kind of know this. So it is a telepathic communication, but it's almost a telepathic communication of feelings more so than words. Right. So, okay. So how did this first NDE happen? Right. So the first one happened in April of 2000, and I was in the hospital visiting my sister-in-law. She had just had a baby that day. And so her RN was actually my friend from high school, and I was standing in the hallway talking to her, and I had a massive seizure. And what I remember, I don't remember the seizure. I just remember opening my eyes, and I was laying in this beautiful white room, and my head was in my grandma's lap. And my grandma had passed a couple of years before that. 
And I remember opening my eyes and seeing her looking like the youngest, healthiest version of herself that I could remember. And I felt this unconditional love and this bliss. And I looked at these walls and they seemed to be alive almost. Each cell, each molecule in them was radiating light and love. And they almost seemed to breathe and move. And although they were having this life experience, they also seemed to be very solid. So it was very interesting. All right. So you were in your grandmother's lap mm -hmm. and in a white room uh, where everything seemed alive. So e even more alive than sort of this life or? Much more alive, much more vibrant than this life. I This life is almost a dream state compared to what a near-death experience feels like. It feels more real than what I am doing in my human life now. And the memories are more vivid. And as I laid there with my head in my grandma's lap, I looked up next to her and there was this 12 foot angel and this angel was absolutely radiant. And it was almost as if I got pulled into her energy. I don't, I don't really know how to explain that better. And as I looked at her, I remember thinking to myself, what is your name? And she answered me in her head. She said, my name's Madeline. I'm one of your guardian angels. And I was surprised because I did not know about telepathic communication and I didn't have that word for it. And yet here she was, you know, kind of answering me. And I decided I wanted to look at her wings because I wanted to see these big feather wings. And as I moved my eyes to them, what I found is they actually were not made of feathers. They were made of light. And that light kind of moved and it was iridescent and translucent. And it was almost like the aurora borealis in the sense that it seemed to span the horizon and span eternity. Wow, that's a beautiful picture, like the northern lights as the angel's wings. Wow. Yeah. Um, so so the angels really do have wings. It's not something we just make up. Um, in the sense of energy, it's almost like there is so much energy with them, it can't be contained to a form. Like we do in our humanness, we contain our energy a lot to a form, but theirs is, yes, it's just an expansive energy. So wings, not in the sense that we would see on a bird, but an overflowing of beautiful energy. Right. But that makes sense that we as humans have interpreted in that way to make it more, you know, understandable for us. <laughs> right. Okay. So what was the message? I mean, the, the angel was there. What was the reason why the angel wanted to show itself? D did you get an answer to that? Right. Um, well, in hindsight, I did. So at that point in time, I remember just being in awe and wanting to sit there and soak it up. I wasn't worried about my body. I had no cares about how I was going to get back to earth. It was just this beautiful experience. So the next thing I know is I hear them yelling code, 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 because I was in the hospital and my body felt very dense, very heavy. My arm felt like it weighed 500 pounds. And I just remember opening my eyes. Obviously I had a headache. I did not feel good. But in hindsight, what I learned from that near-death experience was that our loved ones are always aware of us, even after they've transitioned. My grandma knew I was coming. If just for a moment, she was already right there waiting for me. And my beautiful guardian angel showed herself to me. So I had always believed in angels, but now I knew without a doubt they were real and not just real. She was about 12 feet tall. So she was massive um, in size and energy. So you didn't have any life review or you saw a tunnel or you didn't have a, a decision whether to stay or go back. It sort of seemed very short and sweet. Absolutely. I think it was just an awareness for me that our loved ones are still connected to us and our angels are right there too. So it was truly an opening or an awareness that I was able to take with me. That makes sense. Uh, and I, because I feel like all NDEs are so different that they almost seem tailored 
to each person. That's my experience that even though we do have the tunnel and the life review that many are experiencing that, it's not the case for everyone. Uh, that's my experience. And another thing that I noticed was that you said that your grandmother looked very young and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And my mother had an experience of seeing her father. Uh, he has uh, passed on and she was dreaming and she saw this monk. I'm allowed to share it. <laughs> and she saw this monk walking ahead of her, like with this hood. And then all of a sudden, he slowly turns and he takes off this hood. And she's waking up in her bed and he's standing at the foot of the bed. And she remembers that he looked so pure and so young, like around 30 so beautiful and so clean and pure, but very serious. He was very serious. And I've read that other places as well, that spirits like to show themselves around their 30s. <laughs> is that an experience you have as well? It is. When I'm doing readings, I don't necessarily see them, but I feel them. And their energy does come in feeling around 30, kind of our prime in our humanness, right? We're, we're strong, we're healthy, we're young, and they're very much experiencing that. So think about once we pass and we're in spirit form, we are always in our prime. Wow. But aren't we a bit vain then on the other side, like we want? <laughs> well, we want to feel good. We talk about yeah. vibration and frequency, right? And that's really what spirit resonates with. So if the vibration is, you know, oh, okay, here's what I'm feeling. I feel good. I feel young. I feel healthy. I feel strong. That's what you're going to vibrate with. Right. That makes sense. All right, so let's move over to the other MD, uh, E. Uh, <laughs> what happened then? So that one happened about six years later, and that was in May 2006. And I had had my son, who was my third child, in April. So this was uh, six weeks after. I had had a lot of complications. I had been in the hospital four out of six weeks. And they finally said, look, we need to do a DNC, which is a procedure where they clear out your uterus and um, they just kind of like clean it out in case there's any infection, which was what I was having. So they said, this will be a 45 minute outpatient procedure. It'll be easy. We'll send you home. The night before I had this rock in my stomach, I just knew I should not go through with this. But they told me it would be quick and easy, and I was ready to be home and out of the hospital. So I go in for the procedure, and I remember counting backwards for the anesthesiologist. I'd had anesthesia before, and it was just a blank. It wasn't a dream or anything. It was just nothingness. But I remember counting backwards from him. And the next thing I know, I see my 102 pound white German shepherd dog walk into the operating room. And this beautiful German shepherd had passed a couple years prior. Her name was Tahoe. She walks into the operating room, lays her head on my gurney, looks at me and she's gone. And I'm with her and we are immediately on this phenomenal beach. And on this beach, once again, everything is radiating this light and love. There's unconditional love. There is timelessness. There is bliss. And every drop of water in the ocean, every color of every plant is radiating this. And there are different colors there. The colors are more vibrant than what we've seen with our humanness on earth. And there are actually different colors that I don't even have words to describe. And so she and I were on this beautiful beach and we were running and I was looking at her. She looked like she was about two years old and she was young and healthy. We were communicating telepathically again. I knew she was very happy that I was there and we just kept running and running. And at some point in time, I noticed gosh, it feels like we're running on clouds. This doesn't feel like beach sand. And I started to notice we didn't get hot or tired or thirsty. 
And in those moments, all of a sudden, I can hear my son calling to me. And he was six weeks old and at the house with my mom. And so I can feel myself going to him. And he's very scared that I'm getting ready to leave. And I, I said to him, I said, I will find a way to stay. I'm not ready to leave you. And so all of a sudden, I just started praying. And I started saying, it's not my time. I need help. My kids still need me. And at that moment, I was immediately back in the operating room. I felt Jesus come in. It lit up with this beautiful golden white light. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up in the post-op um, room. And what they had done was I looked at the clock. It was three and a half hours after my surgery start time, which was supposed to be a 45 minute procedure. They had ruptured my uterus in two places and missed my aorta by a millimeter during that surgery. Oh, wow. That's so scary to hear. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Oh my goodness. Yes. Wow. All right. So uh, there's a lot here. So did you have a feeling or a sensation of how long you were away on the other side? Or were you just there and you sort of forgot about Michelle on earth plane? Absolutely. I was just there. And I remember actually being very much aware that there was only the present moment. There was just each step and each breath that I felt like I was taking. There was nothing else. I wasn't worried about my kids. I wasn't worried about Michelle on the earth plane. Um, I was very, it was the most present I had ever been minus my other near death experience. And so when your son came in, um, how did he come in? What, did he come into your memory uh, or did he actually physically call out for you or something in the hospital? Yeah. So that's a great question. So part of me, this is the, in this near death experience, one of the things that I learned is that our soul can be in more than one place at a time. So he was actually at the house with my mom while I was in surgery at the hospital. And what happened was because we are so intertwined with our kids and the people that are close to our life, he could feel that I was getting ready to leave. And so there was a part of my soul that was on the beach with my dog and a part of my soul that actually went to him at the house. And I remember it wasn't words. He was six weeks old, but it was this feeling, this, this telepathic communication of you're leaving. Don't leave me. I just got here. And in that moment, I realized, oh, I need to stay. It's not my time. Oh, wow. D did you feel that there was a sense of choice that you could stay also? You know, I did, or I would say at the very least, I had hope that I could, because whether it was my years of being Catholic that came into practice, right? I immediately started praying and I immediately started saying, I need help. It's not my time. Um, and so because of that, um, I was just able to, what I would say is almost usher in a miracle, but here's what's beautiful about that. All of our souls are capable of doing that. It's when we get in alignment that that can happen for us, whether we are in critical situations like that one or in our daily life. So was it a feeling of, oh, I'm home, you know, this is where I'm from? Because it seemed like you were just enjoying yourself. You weren't like, I have so many questions. What about this? What about that? And I want to go there and here. It seemed like it just seems not nat seemed natural for you to just be in the present moment like that was something you were used to. I would agree with you on that. And I would say that's why in none of my NDEs did I see a tunnel of light. Uh, a lot of people report that that hasn't been an experience I've had. I'm just here and then I'm home. Um, so my soul is goes home very quickly and easily. I don't need a tunnel to guide my way. It appears to know the way home. Wow. All right. So then you come back. Do you start sharing these experiences with people? It took me time. Um, and the only person I really shared this with was my mom. And it usually took a few weeks. So after that experience, I was very, you know, I had a lot of physical trauma. I was in the hospital for a while. It took me three months to even get back to functioning at 80%. So I was just physically um, depleted. But what I would say is that after about two to three weeks, I shared it with my mom. And my mom 
wanted to believe it, but wasn't quite sure, um, you know, how to, how to connect the dots. Because like I said, we still, I didn't know about near death experiences. I knew I had an experience, but that is also a term that wasn't in our vocabulary. And this is before Google. So it wasn't like my mom could get on and Google what is happening to my daughter. She's having these, you know, it, it, so what we had to rely on was the knowledge that we had within us. And in this lifetime, that didn't include words like mediumship and near-death experiences. Makes sense. So what did you work or do at that time? You weren't a medium at that time, right? No, I was a stay-at-home mom. And so I was a homemaker. And and at this point in time, I, I now had three little kids. I had a five-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and an infant. And so after this second near-death experience, I am just working on my physical recovery and coming back to being a mom. But then you die again. I mean, what <laughs> is the odds? And I, I got to say that I have sometimes wanted to have a near-death experience and like here you go and have three of them so yeah it's just amazing what are the odds and this time uh this was quite dramatic uh I would love for you to share that story because when I was listening to it I was like oh my goodness is this possible that actually spirit was stopping time that's yes. things I only see in movies so please share with us what happened. Yeah, absolutely. So this one happened for people who like numbers on 11 11 So November 1st, 2011. And at that point in time, I was in my kitchen. I have 14 foot ceilings in my house. And my oldest daughter, who was 10 at the time, was at school. My five and eight year old were at home. And up towards about 12 feet off the ground, I have these beautiful candles. They're battery operated. They turn on every night at the same time, glow for a while, turn off. So I was changing the batteries and I had the ladder and I was climbing up towards the top. And as I get to the top, I can feel the ladder start to shift. And I immediately think this is going to hurt. I know it's going down. And and I, that was all I could think. This is going to hurt. And at that moment, I am absolutely ripped out of my body, not in a painful way, but in a fast way. And then I am turned around and facing my body. And I'm standing with these three people that I don't know. One is an Egyptian woman, a Hawaiian man, and an Asian man. And I don't know them, but I feel like I've known them forever. They feel like family, friends. And they're looking at me and I'm in this unconditional space of love, timelessness. And as I look, I can see my body is suspended in the air and so is the ladder. Like they're just frozen. It's like a frozen frame on, on the screen. Um, and as I'm standing there, they said to me, they said, Michelle, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay or do you want to go? And at that moment, I see this beautiful angel come in. And this is a different angel than in my first near-death experience. This one is dressed in this beautiful red and gold. And as soon as I see this angel, I just know this angel is here to either take me home or make something happen so that I can stay. And so I was sitting here and I was thinking, this is really interesting. I have forever to decide if I want to stay or go and my body's going to hit the floor in a second or less. So I was really trying to understand this timelessness and how does this work? And at that moment, I could see my younger two kids in the kitchen. And the minute I saw them, I just knew, oh, I need to stay. And the minute that I made that decision, I was uploaded with a bunch of information and it said, okay, Michelle, but you've got to go back and you've got to practice your mediumship. Being a stay at home mom is not your whole purpose. It's part of it, but we have more for you. And I just was given a bunch of information that my marriage most likely wouldn't survive this, um, that I needed to follow through with my soul's plan. And so in that moment that I decided to come back, I then fall. And what happens is as I fall, I hit the back of my head on the corner of my granite island in the kitchen. And so I end up having a five and a half inch skull fracture. I have a brain bleed. I lose my taste, my smell, my equilibrium. I have all sorts of problems, but I survived that fall by half an inch. 
because I literally missed my brainstem by half an inch. Oh, wow. That, that's an incredible story. Oh, there's so, so much to this. Okay. So, uh, and you're, are you fine physically now? For the most part, I still have, um, I still do some cranial sacral therapy and, um, I, you know, I did have a miraculous healing about three years later. So, uh, what the trajectory of my life looked like it would be and the way that spirit works are two different things. So did you ever get an answer to why you had these three NDEs? I mean, it seemed like there was something very important for you to understand or realize since you had three of them. And I'm very, very curious about this because, I mean, myself and a lot of other people are so open and would love to experience more. Now I've had a few spiritual experiences, but still I would love more. Like you had some really direct ones and clear ones. And like, you cannot uh, uh, deny your experiences in a way. So is that something you've asked uh, spirit and gotten a clear answer to? Yeah, well, there are, there are a few different things with this. Number one, the universe will always give us an opportunity to follow our soul's plan. So they tapped me on the shoulder in the first one, they tapped me on the shoulder in the second one, but it really took until the third one to get my complete attention in the way that I did. Also, I do believe in pre-life planning. So I believe that my soul had given myself a few exit points, but clearly in the second one, I am praying for help. It is not my time, I'm not ready to leave. One of the beautiful awarenesses that I had in that was when Jesus came into the operating room, Jesus came in as my friend, not bow down to me, pray to me, you know, it's kind of like, I'm here to help you was the energy that was, was spoken. And so for me, I learned a lot from each near death experience, but it really took until my third one for me to make this commitment to almost my soul's plan that, okay, I am here and this is a huge part of it. Right. So I'm curious about uh, this pre-birth plan, because how concrete is it really? I mean, when you had the option to leave three times, that seems like, you know, there's not a real solid plan there when you could actually leave your children. I mean, that would make a huge uh would be a huge consequence for them. And that would change so many other people's lives. So I'm curious about why it was such a free choice for you. And at the same time, there is a plan there. Right, exactly. That's a great question. So I do believe the plan is like a blueprint. Then we come to earth and we have our free will. Any soul that comes to planet Earth deserves a badge of courage. This is the forefront of learning, of contrast, of challenges in the universe right here on planet Earth, right? So a lot of times our souls will say, okay, I want to go for it, but I'm going to give myself an exit door here and here and here and here. But what happened for me was my kids, two of the three times, pulled me back. And when I saw them, not pulled me back in a bad way, but when I saw them, I said, oh, I'm not done. I need to stay longer. And so with that, there's also this opportunity when my kids came in where they probably knew my pre-life plan. And they said, okay, there's a chance mom could leave here. But my son said, but if I call out to her, there's a chance she could stay. And so there are almost odds, right? Where I think that my son said, oh, there's probably a 80% chance that if she feels me, she'll stay, but she's got to feel me. And the lessons that my son, my soul learned and my humanness learned from these near-death experiences um, are massive. And I could not have learned them any other way. Right. Yeah. Because you said you had a download of information and I'm curious about that. So probably it was information about yourself, but was it also information and knowledge about how the universe works and the afterlife? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and just the fact that none of us are living this life alone, right? So we all have 
spirit teams around us. Those three people that I was standing with were my life guides. But at the time that I had that near-death experience, I didn't even know that term, life guides. So I learned about life guides and angels and how our loved ones are still connected to us. I learned how mediumship is actually a gift for all of us. It's not reserved for a certain few. Everyone has this ability. Many people will call it intuition or like, I just had this gut feeling I should follow this or I shouldn't do that. And so it's really the most natural way for our soul to communicate. Uh, but in our humanness, we, we learn to turn the volume down on that or to maybe even turn it off. Right. Yeah. So uh, is that very specific that uh, we have three guides and one guardian angel or was that specific to you that that can vary for all of us? It varies for all of us. So everyone has at least one guardian angel and at least one life guide. Some people have more of each. And normally we also have almost like a team that rotates in. So let's say if you're starting a brand new business, you'll probably get new life guides and angels that rotate in on that team that kind of specialize in that to guide you with inspiration and those gut feelings. Oh, I should do this. Don't do that. So our teams are constantly evolving depending on what we are facing in our life, but we always have at least one angel and one life guide that never leave us from the time of conception. I have a question that I think it's it's almost a bit hard to ask because I I, um, I feel it's it's a bit dark, but it was this play, I'm a former actress, uh, about this character who was challenging God. Uh, and he started doing the most horrific things. And it was just so awful to watch this um, this theater, uh, this play, uh, because he was like, okay, uh, he was challenging constantly God. Like, if I do this, will you stop me? If I do that, will you stop me? Why won't you stop me doing this or that? And he ended up doing so many horrible, horrible things just to see if God would stop him. Um, and I've been thinking about when I've been really suffering in my depression or other people have been suffering and I've cried out for help and other people have cried out for help and we feel like there's no help. Like we can cry and we can cry and we can ask God to be there or the angels or guides and no one is showing up. Like nothing is happening. Like why is that when you really cry out for, from the deepest of the deepest in you and nothing happens? Right. That's a great question. So it might appear that nothing is happening on the human level, but we have to realize we have um, a, a double plan happening, running parallel. We have the soul's plan running along with the human plan, right? And so what I know about this is that whether our humanness recognizes it or not, we constantly have beings of light who are holding the light around us. So whether these are angels, life guides, grandma, whoever this is, right? Our ancestors on the other side, there really is the spirit team. And so whether or not our humanness recognizes it, our soul knows it is there. So how many people have, and I'm right there with you. I've had those moments too, especially before I got to this point in my life where I thought, oh my gosh, I am all alone in this. But yet, you know what? We know we're not to some level because there's something inside of us that says, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to take the next step. And so a lot of times that isn't coming from our humanness. That is coming from these beings of light that are holding the space around us. Yeah. And I, I guess that that free will comes in that, you know, we can choose like this character did like to do all those awful things like god won't stop us the universe won't stop us because right. the free will is there uh but you're still loved um mm -hmm. but still when you ask questions you get answers uh when someone else asks questions they might not get answers uh or is it that they haven't just trained their ability to listen well, so number one, I do not get all the answers I would like. I have a lot of questions that I don't get answers to. Okay. okay. <laughs> 
I wish it was, I wish it was that easy. I wish it was okay, spirit. Now, what I would say is I am more tuned in to my spirit team and the natural guidance that they give for me probably than most people, but it doesn't mean that I get more than the next step. So I don't have this huge picture of what everything is going to look like in my life, but I do see the next step maybe a little bit more clearly than some people. Part of coming to planet earth is the contrast and not knowing the whole road ahead, just knowing the next step. In our spirit form, we are quite psychic. And I find that when I connect with loved ones on the other side all the time. So they do know what the road ahead looks like. But for us in human form, it's that faith. Okay, I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to take the next step. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there's a reason why the veil is there. And if we knew everything, I mean, we wouldn't learn much. Mm -hmm. Um. So how specific would you say it is that you're going to meet certain people, you're going to have children or not? Like, can these things change or is it like, okay, no, for instance, with your husband, you were supposed to meet him Mm -hmm. and like that he will come in either if you're on Tinder or not, like you will (laughs) meet this (laughs) man. (laughs) Yeah, how absolutely. Could we do that? <laughs> yeah, I you know, so there are things in our pre-life plan that are very solid. So I actually would say, even though that marriage ended in divorce, there was no mistake in it. I was supposed to meet with him. We were supposed to be married 25 years. We were supposed to have these three kids. It was definitely a big part of my life. So there, this is, you know, there's a saying something about what is meant for you will find you or something along those lines. Absolutely. Now we do have free will in the sense that we can put this off. So a lot of times I have ladies come to me and say like, I want to, I want a partner. When is my, my soulmate coming in? But if I feel their energy, they're kind of pushing. They're like, well, I want a partner, but only to send me flowers. I don't want to have to do their laundry. I don't want to have to, you know, we, we put all of these uh, circumstances around it. And so it's really about alignment with your energy. So if you are somebody who says, I am actually ready to have a partner and I want that partner, does your energy align with the statement that you're making? And when your energy aligns, things happen very quickly. Yeah. So it's always back to the inner work. We always have to do the inner work. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a funny question here that I've always wanted to ask and I've never asked it. Okay. So I'm curious, um, do we have food and wine and (laughs) uh, (laughs) drinks on the other side? I was like sitting in Easter. We had such a great time with food and I love red wine. And I'm like, do they have that on the other side or do do I need to let that go? (laughs) I love that. So my experience is once you get to the other side, you can basically manifest anything if you want. So if you would like to manifest a red (laughs) wine or a cannoli or a chocolate dessert, whatever this is, absolutely you can. Right. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, do what? I, from what I've learned, there are levels and uh, sort of hierarchies on the other side, not in a bad way, like we have here, but uh, more like uh, different realms and it, um, that, you know, my soul may be, um, have a home frequency, some places on the other side, while you perhaps have another place. Like, did you learn something about like the different levels? Because, uh, I've read some of Dolores Cannon, and she's saying that uh, de- um, in relation to how developed you are or conscious you are as a soul, uh, you go back to a certain place. I mean, it's so funny with these words, you know, it's mm-hmm. possible we don't have the words for it, but then you are pulled back to a certain place place on the other side or level um did you feel like okay this is where i belong on the other side or did you learn something about these different levels you know the lower astral realm the middle the higher the higher realms the uh, et realms yeah right 
That's a great question. So this is what I would say. Let's talk about it as vibration or frequency. So I don't actually feel like we have to name all of those realms. Look at planet Earth. It holds the energy of Hitler all the way to Jesus Christ and everyone in between. That's a huge range just on our planet. Look at all the vibrations and frequencies right here. So when there's a lot of room to grow just in one space, if we want to call it that. And yes, there is what I would call soul groups, right? Our soul family, places that feel more like home. When we come to planet Earth, it's really great if you think of it about picking a video game. So when my son was younger, he would be in there on his PlayStation. He would be on his headset. He would be talking to kids around the country. They would all pick a team, pick a character and go right in, right? And play the game. And this is very much what we do on a soul level into our human form. So I might pick someone from a different soul family or a different, let's say, vibration or frequency or planet or dimension or whatever you want to call this. And yet we all build our team and we come in to learn lessons together. Now, we will naturally have places that feel more homey than others, but think about it in vibration and frequency. And because we will always evolve, even when we die, we continue to evolve. Our soul learns and grows. We always have beings of light, whether they are our spirit team from this life or other beings of light that will hold that frequency around us. So when people say, well, what about hell? I don't actually believe in a place called hell, but what I do know is that when somebody is in a lower vibration, there are always beings of light holding the space around them for them to upgrade to the next frequency. All right. Okay. Um, let's say you have an experience with a few people like partners who treat you not very well. Um, I'm curious about this because, well, I can be honest about it. I've experienced uh, being with a couple of narcissists in my life, and I didn't know that that was what it was. And, you know, it's a label that a lot of people are using these days. But I've started looking at videos with Dr. Romani and many of those people on YouTube who speaks about um, these, um, yeah, personalities and some are very harsh when it comes to these personalities and say they will never be better some are even say that they're dark souls and all this and I don't resonate with that I find that so difficult to accept because to me yes it was a difficult relationship yes I was verbally abused and all of this it was difficult but I still care about these people um and I still feel that I learned a great deal. And I know that this is coming from their low self-esteem and horrible lives. So I, I forgive them for that. And I think it's sad to think that they're dark souls and they were never evolved and stuff like that. So do you think that when we come down on this planet, we sort of agree that, hey, I'm going to be the bad guy here for you so you can learn to get better boundaries and we're actually on the same frequency on the other side. Or do you think that actually there are like souls who are way on different frequency that are darker and that, you know, some, like you mentioned Hitler, like that is a dark soul that's coming in right. evil. Do you get my question? Yeah, I do. And so I do think that we can team up with souls of other frequencies. Now, here's the thing innately that soul is not evil or bad that person is playing a narcissist in your life so that you can learn lessons and their soul is learning too um, but it doesn't mean that they are a bad evil soul it means that this is the role they've chosen to play right so it is a game where we we choose different characters to play so i'm i'm choosing to be Yannicka right now with uh, a set of issues that I'm struggling with and uh, my personality. So that is like a character I choose to go into sort of. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason that we do this is because when we are in that heavenly realm or in that um, that oneness energy, there isn't the contrast that we have here on planet Earth. So it does make it challenging to learn because, you know, overall, everything's quite pleasant and quite amazing. And you can manifest your wine and your chocolate and whatever else it is that you're looking for, right? 
So we have to have contrast to actually be able to learn and grow. And that's why our soul is like, hey, count me in. When we think of our soul as being eternal and truly humanness cannot comprehend eternal. Um, we really can't. This life is maybe a second. It's a blink of an eye to say, hey, I'm going to sign up for a hundred years at most to go down and learn this because I can't learn it here. It's almost a no brainer for our soul. Our soul's like, well, I've got literally forever. What's one second? Yeah, makes sense. All right. So when you get messages from other souls on the other side, how do they come in? Like, can you, for instance, do you have anybody around now? For instance, this is like, I'm sitting here and you can see my grandfather <laughs> behind me uh, who has a message or is it something you turn on? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So when I'm in readings, I actually turn it on. So I like to say, think of this as a radio or a frequency. So for me, because I'm a mom and I have three kids and I have life to live too, when I go to the grocery store, I'm not connecting with everyone's loved one there. I need to go get groceries, right? So I think about it as this volume and I turn the volume up or down depending on if I'm working or not. With that being said, yes, your grandfather's energy is very strongly around you. Um, so I do want to say that. And I would also tell you this, he's told me that you have a big, um, I want to say almost like leveling up coming in the next three to five months. So I don't know. It feels like it's connected with work. It feels like it's going to go to the next level. I don't know exactly what that looks like for you, but I do expect that to be big. And there's something about writing a book. So if you haven't already thought about writing a book, that's in your energy too. Oh, that's interesting. What was the first thing you said that would come up like in three or five months, you said? A leveling up. So you're going to be going next level with work or with these podcasts. You're going to, it's getting ready to go next level. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> he has come through other times. Uh, so that's interesting. So do you have like a message for those who are listening today? If you could tune in to what sort of people need to hear right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I always go to the angels for that because they always know what's on our heart. And I, and I would say this, that the message that they're giving me is have faith. Each of us needs to have faith um, in ourselves, preferably that we can believe in ourselves to take the next step and find the next right thing for us but also faith in our team. So whether you are aware of your angels or your life guides or your loved ones, we need to have that faith that they are there and that they will continue to present us with opportunities. They're really wanting me to say too right now that, you know, I think for some people, 2023 is a little bit of a roller coaster year. So it's kind of, woo, here we go. Um, but at the end, we're really going to come out on top. So the opportunity with our free will that they're having me say right now is truly in choosing to see things working out for the best. So we can look at the energy of watching the news. Oh my gosh, the world's falling apart. This is horrible. Or we can say, no, I'm going to hold the light and know that this is all going to turn out from the best for the best. They're saying growing pains are just part of planet earth, right? So yes, it's a painful experience at times and as a whole for certain countries or maybe the planet, but it's never to think that this is all coming to an end. It's not going to cease to exist. And should planet earth cease to exist, let's say the sun swallows planet earth, none of us will cease to exist. We will just exist in different realms. Oh, beautiful. And is it more about surrendering? This is something I'm wondering about or manifesting or both together? Both is the magic combination. The best way to manifest is to think of an idea. Oh my gosh, that sounds great. I'd like it. And then you just set it aside and you let the universe pull it in for you. So it is this manifesting and yet surrendering. When I, Michelle, say, oh, I have to have this happen, I can only think of one or two ways that it can happen. When I think, wouldn't this be amazing, and I give it to the universe, the universe says, I see hundreds of ways to make that happen for you. Oh, wow. I love that. Thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for sharing this with us. And can you please share where people can connect with you and how you work today? Yes, absolutely. So they can find me on my website, michelleclaire.net. 
And there you'll find my in-person events. You can schedule one-on-one -on -one readings. You can sign up for a group reading. There's all sorts of different things going on. And, um, you know, it's exciting because whether you're missing someone in spirit or you just want to connect with your angels and life guides and be assured that there is more for you, it's really beneficial because what happens is when we realize we're not living this life alone, we become empowered. Oh, that was beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much for coming on the show and all the best with your work. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from the US and Norway. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this video. And if you liked it, please subscribe and like the video or comment below and let me know what you think. And I would also love for you to check out my other videos on YouTube or wisdomfromnorth.com. See you in the next video.